he soon found another location just a few miles away that he thought would be perfect. A giant wall of solid granite, big enough for multiple carved portraits, each up to six stories tall. There was, he declared, no piece of granite comparable to it in the United States. He also thought that a national tribute to U.S. presidents would be more appealing than heroes of the West. I want to create a monument so inspiring that people from all over America will be drawn to come and look and go home better citizens, he said. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. In that introduction, you heard a recording from the YouTube channel titled The Smithsonian Channel. Mount Rushmore was supposed to look very different. I'll add the link to the transcript. As you heard in that video, Mount Rushmore was intended to be an inspiring monument. You also heard that it's a carved sculpture made in rock. That rock monument, as he said, measures six stories tall. When I say that something is six stories tall, it means that it is the height of a building with six floors. That's one massive monument, right? So in today's lesson, we'll talk about Mount Rushmore, but I would also like to talk briefly about the Crazy Horse Memorial, which doesn't commemorate American presidents, but actually the leader of a Native American tribe called Crazy Horse. The two monuments are just 15 miles away from each other, and they give a small insight into an ongoing issue that the United States government has with Native Americans. In this lesson, we'll also go through the expression to carve in stone. If you are interested in getting all of the bonus material for this episode, which includes the transcript and the MP3, a vocabulary builder exercise, pronunciation drills, and quizzes, be sure to visit AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. You will need to join the classroom in order to access that. So on to the expression of the day, to carve in stone. To carve in stone means to make something permanent. We often use this expression in the negative form. Something is not carved in stone, or we haven't carved it in stone yet. That means that it is not fixed or not permanent. It is subject to change. Someone might ask you, hey, can we change the date and time of the meeting? The response might be, nope, sorry, it's carved in stone. In other words, it's fixed. It's permanent. It is not subject to change. Right? This expression, to carve in stone, is synonymous with set in stone. So according to Grammarist, Dot com, there are two different possible origins of this expression. The first is that it came from Mesopotamia, from the ancient world, where the law of the land was written on stone columns. When the words were carved in stone, the law was official. It was unchangeable. It was permanent. These columns were discovered in 1901, and you can actually see them if you visit the Louvre in Paris. The other possible origin for this expression is from Exodus in the Bible that says that God wrote the Ten Commandments on stone tablets for Moses. Just like the laws created by the king of Babylon in Mesopotamia, God's Ten Commandments were fixed. They were permanent. They were unchangeable. They were carved in stone, right? Both literally and figuratively. So let's go through each individual word. To carve. To carve is a verb, and it means to cut into hard material, to produce a specific design or a structure. So sometimes a sculptor will need to carve into maybe wood or rock in order to sculpt, in order to get a specific result. Some teenagers might even carve hearts into trees with their boyfriend or girlfriend's name, right? So that's something that you might see walking in a park in the United States. In 
in is a preposition meaning within something else, encompassed by something else. I like to swim in pools, in lakes, or in the ocean, for example. Stone. A stone is a rock, and just like rocks, a stone can be any size. Um, this is different from pebbles, for example, which are very small rocks or stones, and boulders, which are very large rocks or large stones. So speaking of the expression carved in stone, you probably first thought of the Rosetta Stone, which is a stone that was discovered in 1799 in Egypt that had carvings or was carved with hieroglyphics and ancient Greek. The Rosetta Stone was sort of a way for early linguists to understand hieroglyphics. Right, and to better understand an ancient world. So now we'll go through three different examples of this expression so that you can hear how we would use it in regular, everyday situations. Example number one, imagine that you just got engaged, right? Your significant other, maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend, asked you to marry them. And so you call your parents to tell them the news. The thing is, your fiancé is from another country, and so the first thing your parents want to know is where the wedding will be. You can tell them, well, nothing is carved in stone. In other words, the plans are not fixed, nothing is for sure, these plans are subject to change, but we're thinking about having the wedding in the United States. Example number two, and this one is a personal example. Last week, my husband and I were talking about taking a trip to Miami to visit some of his friends from Brazil, and I'd been very adamant, or very uncertain, very hesitant about flying on an airplane with my daughter, Julia, because she's only seven months old and babies aren't given measles vaccines until they're one year old in the U.S. And Lucas said, oh, that's not a problem. What if we drive to Miami? What if we take a road trip? and we visit national monuments, national parks, and so much more along the way. And so we looked up camper vans online and thought, hmm, this might actually work out. And the thing is, he told his friends, and now I think they expect us to come, even though, to me, our plans were not set in stone. Our plans were not carved in stone. They were not permanent or fixed when my husband told our plans to his friends. Example number three, imagine that you want to go wine tasting with friends next weekend and you call one of your friends to ask them if they'd like to come. And they ask you what time you plan on leaving. And you think to yourself, hmm, what's a normal time of the day to have a glass of wine? 10 a.m.? So you tell this friend, how about 10 o'clock? And they say, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And you say, well, wait, wait a second. Nothing is carved in stone yet. I will call you when the plans are fixed, right? So in other words, the 10 o'clock time is not permanent. It's not fixed. It is not carved in stone. But I will let you know when it is. To practice your American pronunciation, I'd like to do a repeat after me exercise. We'll use the question, is it carved in stone? In other words, is it permanent? Is it fixed? Repeat after me. Is. Is it? Is it carved? Is it carved in stone? Is it carved in stone? Let's go ahead and do the conjugation. I carved it in stone. You carved it in stone. She carved it in stone. He carved it in stone. It carved it in stone. We carved it in stone. They carved it in stone. Once again, to carve something in stone means to make it permanent. Now that we've wrapped up pronunciation, let's move on to the fun fact of the day. 
and this time we'll be traveling to the Black Hills of South Dakota. South Dakota is a state in the United States that has always been heavily populated by Native Americans, which we also call American Indians. This is where both the Mount Rushmore Monument and the Crazy Horse Memorial can be found, just 15 miles away from each other. Both are monumentous rock sculptures, Mount Rushmore of four remarkable presidents that helped build the United States, and Crazy Horse, a Native American war hero who was known for protecting Indian culture and its land from the takeover of the U.S. government. Seems sort of political, doesn't it? <laughs> it is, actually, and it's a short story, but one that illustrates early relationships between the U.S. government and the Native Americans. So to the Lakota Indians, one of the prominent American Indian tribes in the Black Hills, the Black Hills were sacred. Within the hills were the burial sites of their relatives, and it was an area for prayer, for dance, and for worship. The hills were central, and are still central, to their culture. Long ago, before Mount Rushmore was carved, the United States knew this, and they dedicated this land to the American Indians as part of the Great Sioux Indian Reservation, with a treaty called Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. However, when gold was found there just six years later, the United States government took the land back. That's right, they promised to protect that land from being settled by white men, but then they went back on their word. They settled the land, mined it for gold and for silver, and forced the Native Americans of that region to relocate. So this is kind of ironic because in American English, when someone who gives a gift wants that gift back, we actually call them an Indian giver. It's a term that's somewhat politically incorrect nowadays, but you, you'll still hear it used every now and then. So in this circumstance, um, the American government could be considered an Indian giver, right? They gave the land away, but then they took it back. Tension because of this still exists today. Many of the Lakota never accepted the takeover of their land and since 1876, they have tried to get that land back by filing lawsuits against the United States government. A most recent one called the United States versus the Sioux Nation of Indians took place in 1980, where the Native Americans charged the U.S. government of violating their own laws and abusing their power. And in the end, the United States didn't end up giving the land back. They offered a lot of money, but... Uh, the Native Americans did not accept that. So that's the heat of the fire right there, right? Now let's flash forward to the 1920s. South Dakota, the state where this all took place, was still largely uninhabited, and they were in hopes of drawing in more tourism to the area, right? So a historian proposed the idea of Mount Rushmore to a sculptor named Gutson Borglum. The original idea for the sculpture was to carve heroes' faces from American history, such as Lewis and Clark, the Red Cloud, and Buffalo Bill Cody, into the very pointed rocks in Needles, South Dakota. Borglum knocked down the idea. He rejected it. By carving into these pointed rocks, they'd look like, quote, misplaced totem poles. He wanted it to be majestic. He wanted it to stand out. He wanted people all over the United States to come to see it, right? So instead, he chose a giant granite rock that faced the sun. And then instead of carving some of the heroes of the American West, he suggested carving historically important presidents in order to attract larger audiences. And that's exactly what was done. At the very front of the monument, you'll see George Washington, who fought for America's independence from Britain. He was the first president of the United States. Next to him is Thomas Jefferson, who was a founding father of the United States, meaning he helped found the nation to help create the nation. 
he was the main author of the Declaration of Independence. He also purchased Louisiana from France in 1803, which actually doubled the size of the United States. The third is Theodore Roosevelt, who led the U.S. through economic growth of the early 20th century and was a very strong advocate for creating nature reserves, right, to preserve the natural environment of the United States. And last but not least, Abraham Lincoln, who held the U.S. together during the Civil War and, of course, as you all probably know, abolished slavery in the U.S. Right? He got rid of slavery. So there are four very great American presidents, very historically important, and very carefully chosen for their contribution to building the United States that we know of today. In 1927, construction began on this monument. 400 workers worked all day long, regardless of the weather conditions, to carve the president's faces into that stone. And it was hard work. For $8 a day, the workers climbed 700 stairs to get to the top of the rock. And once at the top, they would clock in. To clock in means to officially begin work. Some would then drop down in front of the rocks, connected to steel cables, and begin either exploding the rock using dynamite or doing precision work, such as cutting the features of the president's heads. For example, their eyeballs or their, their noses, their mouths. And they would do that with a jackhammer. About 90% of the work, though, was done with dynamite, according to nps.gov. So it was very dangerous. Now, what's funny to me is flashing back to this time before technology, right? They didn't have walkie-talkies to communicate. They didn't have pagers. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have any way to communicate other than with their voices, and so people at the very bottom of the monument needed to talk to people at the top, right? They're carving big faces. How else are they going to see the larger picture than by talking to someone down below who had a better view of it, right? So they needed to talk back and forth. So in order to do so, they had some people, some men and women who had jobs as yellers. <laughs> so they would yell information back and forth from the top to the bottom of the mountain. All right, can you imagine that? <laughs> they said his eyeball is too small. Blow off another seven inches. <laughs> it's kind of funny to imagine. In any case, many simply took these jobs because it was the Great Depression, a time in the United States when work was hard to come by. It was hard to find. By 1941, around $990,000 had been spent, but that's when they ran out of funding, right? The money was gone. So instead of drilling all the way down to the president's waists, right, their hips, as originally planned, the project stopped at the president's necks. So that's why we just see their faces in the rock. So the U.S. Uh, has a national registry of historic places, and Mount Rushmore entered it in 1966. Right? And nowadays, almost 3 million visitors come to see it every year. As for the Lakota Indians, well, they thought carving into sacred mountains was a no-no. But as I mentioned before, just 15 miles away is the Crazy Horse Memorial. He's only partially complete, but his very stern or serious face can be seen from a distance. The image, once completed, will be of him pointing off into the distance while riding a horse. So how did he come to be? The memorial was initiated by Standing Bear, who was an elder and leader of the Lakota tribe in the 1900s. Standing Bear was actually very upset by the fact that the U.S. had taken land back when promised to them, and he felt inclined to do something about it. So he created a nonprofit and began raising private funds to begin the project. He continually was able to rally people behind him to support the recognition of the Lakota war hero, who he thought belonged next to the U.S. president's faces on Mount Rushmore. It was Lakota land, after all, <laughs> that the U.S. had promised to them, and that Crazy Horse also tried to protect. 
So what better than to create a momentous carved monument in this Lakota territory depicting their leader, but on a much larger scale than Mount Rushmore. When finished, Crazy Horse will be 640 feet long, that's 195 meters long, and 563 feet tall, that's 172 meters tall. Just as a reference, the heads of the presidents at Mount Rushmore only measure 60 feet, or 18 meters tall. Today, the face of Crazy Horse has been completed, and continuation of the project is being paid for through visitors' tickets, classes taught there, and many other different sources. The weird thing is that the U.S. government has offered large sums of money to help pay for this carving, but uh, it was refused by these Native Americans because they thought they would need to compromise some of the story if they accepted the money. You might need to put the United States government in a good light if you accept money from them, right? So what's even more strange, perhaps, about this whole thing is not just the animosity between the Lakotas and the U.S. government about the territory, but actually tribe members' reactions to this crazy horse memorial. So in the Lakota culture, big decisions are decisions made by the families. Family members of Crazy Horse claim to have never given their consent to build such a memorial in the sacred hills, right? These are air, This is an area that you cannot carve in. It's the burial grounds of relatives. One of Crazy Horse's relatives called it a, quote, desecration of our Indian culture. To desecrate means to violate or disrespect something of value. So at the end of the day, the Crazy Horse Memorial is still being worked on, right? The plans are carved in stone, <laughs> right? Both literally and figuratively. And so no matter how many political issues there are in South Dakota regarding the Native Americans and the U.S. government, one thing is for sure. Both are remarkable works of art and reminders of American history, whether it's the positive history of the famed presidents at Mount Rushmore or the less so positive reminder of the U.S. government's mistreatment to the Native American tribes in South Dakota, they're there for all of us to see, right? Carved in stone in these sacred hills. So that's it for today. If you're interested in learning more about the Crazy Horse Memorial, I highly recommend looking up some videos on YouTube. Otherwise, once again, if you're interested in the bonus content for this episode, you can access that on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks, and until next time, bye.